Oh, I couldn't have asked for a better introduction into my sermon than that. And you'll find out why in just a moment. If you got your Bibles, you can turn to Ephesians 3. We're going to look there. And as you're turning, I know Larry Domigan gave a, a poinsettia in memory of Judy. Who else gave flowers? Who would like to say the names? Who they're for? Anyone? Yeah, Joe. Judy Klein and Dusty Roar. Okay. Anybody else give one? Okay. Thank you guys very much. What was Christmas intended for? Is the birth of Christ and the giving of a Messiah simply about eternal life in the future? Or was God attempting to do much more than that? I believe with every ounce of my being that God wants more than just something later down the road and, and a hope for that. Now that is what drives us and gives us encouragement to, to face the things that we are in now. But God intends so much more for the church than just waiting for something later. And we just heard some stories of some of those things that God is looking for from the church. And a couple things that Leslie shared are exactly what I want to talk about this morning. One thing she said was, which really hurt my feelings, was that guy could quote scripture better than our pastor. <laughs> well, didn't plan for that. We got a free gift today. Rick? This is the next thing on the list. <laughs> Don't mess with me. <laughs> I am... I'm, I'm leaning now. Anyway, were we talking about anything particular? <laughs> we, that he could quote the scripture but never learned how to imply it or to make it alive in his life. And I think... That is one of the key points that I want to bring it to light today is how do we do that? God sent his son for much more than later. He wants the world changed now. The angels came and told them in Luke that there be peace on earth and goodwill among men. That God wants there to be things that happen now and not just hope for later. And the other thing that she shared is what she talked about that her nine-year-old spoke into her. And she said exactly the way I was going to say it this morning. That he saw that woman through God's eyes. And she saw them through critical eyes or something along that line. The hope of God, by sending his son was not to just redeem creation for later, but to put the fullness of him and his spirit back in us that we could begin to live out God's life in this world and see it the way he sees it. Jesus came to restore what Adam and Eve broke through the enemy's work. And what Adam and Eve broke through the enemy's hand was not just that they were going to die. But they quit living in the fullness of God. And the fullness of a spirit. They were humans who were filled with the spirit of God. They, weren't, they didn't sin. They had his nature. It is the only thing in creation, he says, I will make them in my image. Male and female. And God is a giver. And it is our nature, our created nature that fell, but it was our created nature that we would see the world the way God sees the world. And what I intend to share today, if we can understand it and take a hold of it, will transform your life and mine and how we relate in this world and how we live in peace ourselves in the Spirit. Let's pray for just a moment. Father, I want you to do what you need to do here today. 
Father, let your spirit free in this place. Lord, there is so much more available to the church than what we are experiencing. And it is not your fault. Lord, just speak and do what needs to be done today despite me, Lord. Move among the hearts of the broken today. Those who may be struggling here lately or have struggled their whole life to find the peace that goes beyond their understanding. Lord, I think there's a message of hope today for your people. And more than that, a message that will transform our world. Lord, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ephesians chapter 3. At the end of the chapter, starting at verse 14, Paul begins to pray. And it's an absolutely incredible prayer for the church. And my challenge for you today is that you'll memorize this prayer and begin to pray it for yourself and for your family and for your friends, for your co-workers and for our community. Just let me read it to you for a moment. Verse 14 on. Paul says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven on earth derives its name, that he, Father, would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond what we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Paul was praying that we would be filled up to all the fullness of of God. That's a lot. All usually means all. I think, well, we can't. Well, sure we can. Adam and Eve at one point were filled with fullness. They chose to walk away from that. Christ also filled with the fullness of God. And now, through Christ, us. He wants us to be filled with the fullness of God. I don't know if any of you have noticed, our world's insane. And getting more so every day. I want to say this carefully, but maybe you'll understand what I mean. I don't think we're going to change it. The scripture says it's going to get worse and worse until Christ returns. I'm afraid to put my hand on this side. I don't know why. It's going to get worse and worse until he comes. We can change our world around us, but the general move towards darkness, I think, is inevitable. And if that is the case, what do we do? It's like the show, I don't know, I can't remember the name, one of those fishing shows where they're out in the North Sea, and they're really stupid, because they're out in the North Sea, on a boat that doesn't look near big enough to be in those waves. And they get thrown around like rag dolls, and then they die. You know that show? And I think that's the way I feel in this culture, just slammed. But what we can do as the captain of our ship is make a decision to keep the nose of it into the waves and do our best to hold on, and that we keep ourselves in integrity, that we live in the power of the Lord. I'm absolutely terrified for my children and grandchildren. To grow up in a world that is far darker than the world I grew up in. And that the generation before me grew up in. Any of you that have parents and grandparents have that same fear? 
Get an amen anywhere? Amen, all right? So what do we do? What do we do to help them face the darkness that is coming? Well, we need to get a program. We need to get accountability. We need to make sure that they don't go out with certain friends on Friday nights. We need to hide them away in their room until, you know, so that the world can't get a hold of them. Eventually, though, what? They get out. As hard as we lock them in, they're going to get out. And that is why the attrition rate from the church from 18 on is horrible. They get 18, and they get their freedom, and they just walk away from the Lord. And the question is, why? It's because they haven't been filled up with the fullness of God and rooted and grounded in his love. You can only account someone, hold them accountable so much. We need to be so filled with the spirit and the power of God in us that we couldn't walk away from the Lord if we tried. So in love with Jesus and the fullness of who God is and what he is doing in this world that we would never walk away. That is what we need to pray for. Look at this prayer again. I've been praying that he would strengthen you, verse 16, with power through his spirit in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, length, height, and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. When's the last time you prayed to anything close to that? For your kids, for your church, for your husband, for your wife. If this verse 19, 18, 19 became a reality in the heart of every believer, you wouldn't have to worry about them walking out the door at 18 if they are filled with the fullness of God. Our problem is, which the enemy does and has done since the beginning, he is taking everything beautiful that the Lord has made and perverted it and changed it. Love, the gift of sex, has become lust and pornography and immorality of all kinds. He took what God put in man and woman, the, the desire to love and the desire to be loved, just like God loves to be loved by his children. But he turned the fullness of the nature of us, which is to love, and now we need to be loved primarily. Everything in us wants to know, well, what am I going to get out of this? We weren't built for that. And the problem is that if we live that life, which is the broken life, uh, the broken level of love that God intended for us, therefore everything that determines how we feel is based on what somebody else does. Are you following me? If my boss isn't nice to me today, or gives me the horrible job, all of a sudden now I feel horrible because what I need from them is something better. But what God intended was that we would be so full of his spirit and that we would see that boss through God's eyes that when we see them acting like jerks, which they do sometimes, instead of being angry, we'd feel sorry that there's something hurting and broken there. Back to the dis lady at the checkout. I think God does want us to see people in that situation with empathy and not with anger. The problem is that that's not our nature anymore. All the feelings we have, the negativity, the frustration, the hurt, those are all often based on because somebody isn't treating us right when what God wants to do is for us to begin to see them through his eyes and it would change everything. For God was so frustrated with the world, so tired of them making mistakes and despising him and messing with his creation that he finally sent his son. Is that how John 3.16 goes? For God so loved the world 
that he gave. Now, he could easily have said the other. See, God's nature isn't affected, who he is isn't affected by how we act. We agree with that, right? And we are created in his image. And we used to be that way, that love came from us, no matter what anyone else did to us. Jesus on the cross. They just got done beating him. Scripture says that he was unrecognizable. And as he hung on the cross, and they were mocking him and making fun of him, did it change who he was? He said, Father, forgive them, because they what? They don't know what they're doing. That's a different set of eyes. <laughs> the Bible says he could have called 10,000 angels, and they're the mob angels, right? They're the tough guys. Guido, I've had enough. Come get him. And the way we feel, and by the way, our feelings are not the ones that God intended us to have, most of our feelings. They're kind, they came as a result of the curse. Our feelings, if we were on the cross, was, Lord, they are rotten people. I'm righteous. I should not be treated this way. I have a right not to be, I have a right not to be treated this way. So does God, by the way. Get them. And get them good. But Jesus looked at him and he says, Lord, they don't, they don't even know what they're doing. And we hear in his voice compassion for the brokenness of the people that are killing him. Well, how? Why? Where do you get there? Well, it's because he's Jesus, Son of God. Scripture just says that Paul says that through Christ and through the Spirit of God, the fullness of God that is in Christ can be in us. That no matter what anyone says or does to us, we don't have to live in their view of us because of who God is in us. Paul was like that. We're going to imprison you. Oh, oh, great. Then I'll be a testimony in prison. Well, then we'll kill you. Well, the die is gain. Well, then we'll let you free. Then I'm going to go preach. He said he was a dead man. You can't do much to a dead man. No matter what was going to happen to Paul, he was never going to walk away from God. Therefore, what other people did did not determine the joy of his life. Now, Jesus struggled with what he had to go through. In the garden, he wept before the Lord. He sweat great drops of blood. It doesn't mean that we won't have struggles. But the nature, the very nature of who we are, where we want joy and peace down deep, comes not and will never come from others' expectations or thoughts of us. It will come from the fullness of God in us. That's why God sent his son. Scripture says that the fullness of time, he sent his son into the world. And it wasn't just to give us something later on. It was to bring peace and goodwill back to the world. That every morning we would wake up and pray again and ask God for the fullness of His Spirit within our heart that we'd be grounded and rooted in love and that when we walk out the doors or even when we're among our family that we would see them with the eyes of God. So many addictions would be changed for the body of Christ if we would receive the fullness of the Spirit of God in us. Addictions to pornography would be broken if men would see those women through the eyes of God and not as objects of lust, but broken over the fact of their exploitation and then the brokenness that is probably in them. That they are someone's daughters, let alone the father's daughters. God, my, my son, he's just, you know, he's got this drug problem. Lord, I just ask you to help him with drugs. That's, there's nothing wrong with praying that. But what you need to pray is this. Father, 
Fill my son with the fullness of your spirit. Root and ground him in the love of Christ. If, if we can get that prayer answered in whatever situation we're fighting in, the outcome will be different. But I know what you're saying. Well, if, if I just love everyone else and, and they're going to treat me like a doormat, yeah, maybe. That's what Jesus did. In fact, Peter says that we were created to take offense. Wow. And continue to love. But if the church, all of us, rooted and grounded in love and we're praying for the fullness of the Spirit to come into us, your needs are going to be met because others are going to love you as you love them. But there's going to be peace that comes when we allow this to happen in us. Notice what he says here in verse 19. It's kind of a funny phrase. That they were not only in the length and height and depth and breadth and all that, and to know, to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge. I want you to know something that goes beyond knowing. Huh? How do you know something that is beyond knowing? It comes to experience. And this is why Paul says, this is why I fall on my knees. I can't teach them enough for them to know this depth and breadth and height of God's love. Only you can do that. I can't stand up here and teach you. I'm not good enough. Not even close. But my prayer today is that you just start asking every day this prayer for your life for your family, for your husband, for your wife, for your kids, for your job, for Jimmy in the next cubicle. We all have a Jimmy in the next cubicle, don't we? Lord, if you love me, you wouldn't put me next to Jimmy. I'm sorry if you're Jimmy today and you have a cubicle. I'm not talking about you. Yes, I am. Lord, why do I have to be next to Jimmy? That is human eyes under the curse. Instead of saying, Lord, thank you that sitting next to Jimmy is someone who loves you so much and that you have filled with the fullness of your spirit that I can be your hands, your feet, your grace to Jimmy. It changes our perspective. It's not that we don't struggle with depression or we're not going to have tough times, but I'm telling you, you're going to have a lot less if you begin to look at the world through those eyes. God sent his son into the world to change it now to get ready for tomorrow. What is in your life that is ripping you apart right now? You're thinking, Lord, what, what's, I need a book with five steps to get this fixed. There's nothing wrong with those. My guess is most of those problems would would find their relief and release if we begin to pray this prayer. That the power of God would dwell in our hearts. Chapter 1 of the same book of Ephesians says, the power of God is the one that raised Jesus from the dead. In other words, it's limitless. Lord, but the situation I'm in, it's, it's unfixable. Mm, at least half true. On the other half, maybe. But not on yours. If you ask God for the fullness of his spirit and that his love, the love of Christ, would be rooted and grounded in, in, in your life in such a way that it changes the way you look at whatever that issue is. And begin to look at them through Father's eyes and not ours and that they need to meet our needs instead of he needs to meet our needs. It is my prayer for me that as a pastor I do a better job of being on my knees before the Father for each one of you every week. Asking him to dwell in your hearts. That there's something in here that is so profound that no one could ever take you away from the Lord. 
I heard a pastor speak this past week talking about shortly after he was a believer and he had to start having a group meeting in his house. He said, I broke down in tears as the love of God had come over me and, and the power of his spirit was changing and transforming my life from being a jerk to, to being a child of God. And I remember telling that group, he said that, and he looked at his beautiful children, he says, they could take my children from me and look at his beautiful wife and said, and take my wife and I will never walk away from the Lord. And, ah, Job would not walk away from God. Because when the Spirit of God lives on us in a deep way, we know that whatever the world takes, God will replace. Maybe in this life or in the life to come, tenfold, Scripture says. You remember that? The, the, the rich young ruler comes to J Jesus and says, what do I have to do to be saved? And Jesus says, well, you need to keep the commandments. I've been doing that. You need, you know, I got that. What else do I need? And Jesus knew the real thing that was bothering him was that he had a, the money had a hold on him. And he says, I want you to sell everything you have, give it to the poor and follow me. And he's like, uh, um, sorry, can't do that. I'm out of here. And he walks away. And two verses later, Jesus starts talking about what it means to follow him. And he says, whoever gives up farms and houses and lands and family for me will receive it back ten times in this life and in the life to come. The very thing that the guy was afraid of losing was going to offer to be tenfolded in this life and in the life to come if he would follow him. And apparently he had a lot. He could add a lot more. And I've shared this story before. It's one of those stories that just rips my heart apart. Where, what land is that that he had? He doesn't have it now. That I'm sure of. That was 2,000 years ago. You know how many times that's changed hands? But his heart hidden in Christ would have never changed hands. The kingdom of God that lasts forever would never have been taken from him. And when we allow the fullness of the Spirit of God to dwell in our hearts, that is so sunk within us that no matter what the world may take away, we will not walk away from God. And you will have peace that goes beyond understanding. I want you to know the love of Christ that can't be known. That's what he says. He says, that's why I bow my knees. It is a spiritual thing that takes place. God brought Jesus into the world in the most humblest of places so that any of us could find him. And in finding him, we find the light of men. We don't have time, but Psalm 139, David says, where could I go that I could be outside of your presence that you wouldn't find me? If I go to the heavens, you're there. If I go to the grave, you're there. If I hide in the depths of the sea, you'd find me. If I go to the farthest place and hide in the desert, you're still there with me. He says, your thoughts just go beyond. His love will reach us anywhere. But he also wants his love in us to reach out everywhere too. That the one that is breaking your heart, the one that is not what you need him to be, the, the situation at work or the kid that has abandoned you and your family, that you don't give up on them. And that your love is as high and as wide and as deep as necessary and you continue to reach out in love. There is so much freedom in these verses for the church. It is my prayer and the lack of ability in my words to get this said that I'm just going to pray this over you now and if the worship team just come up as I'm praying this I want you to bow with me I'm going to pray these verses for us bow with me please Father we do bow before you right now knowing that every family in heaven on earth gets its name from you Father I'm asking that you would grant according to the riches of your glory Strengthen these people. 
to strengthen me through your spirit and power in our inner being so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith and that we would be rooted and grounded in love and may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth and to know the love of Christ which goes beyond all knowledge that we may be filled up Father, with all your fullness. Father, we, we don't believe it. We just, we, we know we're weak and we just don't know if it can really happen. And yet, the very next verse, you inspire Paul to write, and now to him who's able to do exceeding be abundantly beyond all that we can ask or think. Lord, there are people right here in this room that are praying right now for things that they think are impossible. And not only can you do those, you can do above and beyond those things. Lord, put that in their hearts. Fill them to the fullness of your spirit in their lives that works within us. Lord, to you be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all the generations forever and ever. Amen. Church, I'm going to ask you to pray this this week. I want you to keep your bolt and right here in Ephesians 3. Before you go to bed at night, I want you to pray that prayer for you. I want you to pray for your mate. I want you to pray for your kids. I want you to pray for the people in this church. That the fullness of God would fill this congregation. Let's stand and sing our closing song together. If you're ready to give your life to Christ, we encourage you to come forward and meet me and talk about that. If you want just prayer, just want somebody to pray for you, Come up, you can pray by yourself. If you want someone to pray with you, we'll get someone up here to pray with you as well. But let's sing our closing song.